we continue to sing.
the name of Jesus, that we would exalt his name, that we would keep him in his right place, the Lord of lords, Lord. We cannot fathom the goodness of who you are, Lord. We praise your name because you, because you are good. You are faithful as we pray today. Lord, I pray that our hearts would always be ones of praise, that we can look back at this week, we can look back at this month, we can look back at our lives and continually see how you have orchestrated our lives, that you've been there, that you've provided, Lord, that you've walked with us. And I pray that we'd be people who could praise you day in and day out because of who you are. Because, Lord, we cannot even fathom the goodness, we cannot fathom the greatness of who you are. God, I'm so grateful that you've gathered us here today. And I pray that the praise that we shared with you today was delightful to your ears. God, you are good. You are great. And I pray these things in your name. We all said, amen, amen. We'll grab a seat today. It is a great day to be here at Vail. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Mike. I get to serve on staff as one of the pastors here. And if you're new to Vail, whether you're in the room or you're with us online, we are so grateful you joined us today. Maybe you had a friend invite you, maybe you had a coworker tell you you should come here, or maybe you just drove past our property. And you're like, this place looks like a place I wanna hang out at. We're glad you're here and we would love to be able to connect with you. So if you're new with us, would you do me a favor? Would you take out your phones really quick? Text next to the number on the screen, which is 309-777-0677. If you don't have your phone with you, don't worry, we got you covered. If you look in the seat back pocket in front of you, there is a red card that says my next step. Grab that card, fill that out, check the box that I'm new here. And if you're new, make sure before you leave today, stop off at the info center. We'd love to greet you. We'd love to welcome you to Vail. And when it comes to you giving us your information, we're not gonna spam you. We're not gonna bombard you with emails. We're simply gonna say, hey, we're so grateful you joined us and find ways to help you connect with Vail and answer any questions that you may have today. And if you're here today with some kids, I want to let you know something happening right now. It is called our Veil Kids program. It's from birth all the way to fifth grade. Nathan and Lauren and their team of incredible volunteers every single week create an incredible experience for kids at their phase of life to man, show them what it means to look a little bit more like Jesus. So, so you've yet to engage with Veil Kids. I encourage you, after service today, stop off, talk to the team, see what they're all about. As you look across the room, You'll see some people with Red Veil Kids shirts. You can ask them a question as well. It is a great, great time. And today we got something special, unique in our, mess, uh, in our experience today, is that we have one of our organizations that we partner with at Veil Church called CFR with us today. And Pastor Sean has a special message he wants to share with you today. So give your attention to the screens. Hey everyone, if we have not had the privilege of meeting, my name is Sean Jensen and I get to serve here at Vail Church. I'm gonna introduce you to this guy here in a moment, but before I do, I gotta let you know, uh, just being here recently, this last year, I've been able to talk with different people our church partners with in different organizations. And I'm telling you, when it comes to being intentional with our generosity and how we handle not just the money you guys give to our church, but I believe that can also turn into how you can invest. There's this thing called CFR, Christian Financial Resource, and the more I learned about it, I was like, I got to introduce this to our church and just the cool concept of what it looks like. And so for us to do that, we got Jared Walker here from CFR. But I want to introduce you today and let them know a little bit more about Christian Financial Resources. Yeah, thanks, Sean. CFR was started in 1980 as a nonprofit financial ministry, specifically a church extension fund. And in our 44 year history, we have funded just shy of a thousand ministry loans to churches across the US awesome. like Vail. And those loans total over $1.3 billion. My goodness. Now, th those are big numbers. They maybe sound impressive, but I like to, to step back and remember every one of those represents a story. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite stories is a church not far from here in Washington, Illinois. Yeah, that's just down the road. Yeah, yeah, Highview Christian Church. They put up a shell of a building that was gonna be their new worship center. And the plan was as volunteer labor allowed and dollars allowed, they would finish it as their new worship center. Well, 12 years later, it was still unfinished. Oh my gosh, that's a long time. Yeah, they decided it was time to finally finish it, you think? And so they reached out to a, a lender, they got terms for a loan, shared it with their church, had a congregational vote to move forward, and right before closing, the church found out that the lender was gonna have to change the terms in a way that didn't benefit the church. So they reached out to us, three weeks later, we closed on that loan. I got to be there 
shortly after they opened the new space. And every time that I am there, there's one person I look for. It's the sound guy. Because the first time in that new space, after the service was over, he walked up to me and said, I found a home here. No way. It's Didn't just, know Jesus before. Today he knows Jesus because of that. It's really cool because that's like the, the vastness of the story is it's not just partnering with an organization, but that's helping churches. And while it's helping a church, it's helping other churches. Exactly. And it pours down to people who honestly like will fill these seats. Personally, being intentional as a church, we can invest, but what does that look like for someone like just myself or someone who's watching? People often ask, where do we get all those dollars to be able yeah. to make all those loans? It's the example of the early church that we follow in that. We've been able to make loans to churches because people like you and me, Christian business owners, churches like Vail have invested dollars at CFR. It's good stewardship for two reasons. You know every dollar is being used just to help churches and you're gonna earn a rate of return. And one of my favorite things to help you be generous and a good steward as you're generous, we have something called a giving fund. It's a donor advised fund works kind of like a charitable checking account. You can fund the ministries you love like Vail, but can come with significant tax advantages. And again, with every one of those, you're earning interest, but you're also making a kingdom impact because you know how those dollars are used. Yeah, the more I learn about all this stuff, it's so cool. And even being able to sit with our you know, finance team and be able to be able to look at the options we have, not just for us, but the, uh, we know that they're also helping that. I'm a church planner at heart. And so just hearing about this, I wish I knew about it before I got here. I'm glad to be here, but it's so cool to see what you guys are doing. So if anyone needs any more information about this awesome opportunity when it comes to investing and all that, where can they go? What does that look like? A couple different ways you can find out more, whether uh, you're watching this online or you're in the room. Uh, at Vail, you can scan the QR code. Those will take you to a form. You can provide your contact info and we'll follow up with additional information. Anybody that happens to be in the room this weekend, I'll be out at a table in the lobby. Would love to answer any questions that you have. Cool. Uh, would love to hear your favorite uh, Sean mishaps during service. Right. Uh, would love to hear those as well. Provide your contact info that way and I'll follow up with additional information. Well, one of my mishaps was telling the, the church that uh, I'm a Bears fan. And so uh, I know you're from Wisconsin, but Good news is, fans. yes, good news is I'm not a Packers fan. <laughs> but that shouldn't stop you from being intentional. We're so glad for CFR and what we've been able to accomplish through them. And so thank you so much, Jerry, for coming, sharing all that heart. I love the story. Thank you for taking time to listen. And I'm telling you, take that next step. Find a way that not only can you be intentional with your finances, but how you can make a difference in other people's lives as well. We appreciate you guys so much. Well, if you have any more questions, you know there's a little pamphlet in the seat back pocket in front of you. We love CFR. If you have any other questions, you want to talk to Jared, he's out in the lobby today. So as you leave, go out towards the cafe, take a left. You'll see him and the CFR table all set up and ready to answer any questions that you may have today. So as we get ready for today's message, we can see we got a pretty full room today. What we like to do in this part of our service is make a big room feel a little bit smaller. So over these next few moments, would you do me a favor, get to know the people around, just say hi, hello, starting off a brand new series today called Relational Vampires. Maybe ask the question, hey, what's your greatest pet peeve? But let's get to know some people around us today. Hello everyone, good morning. How's everybody doing? Doing good. It was kind of funny when Pastor Mike was like, hey, look to the person next to you and share your biggest pet peeve. I saw one person, I'm not gonna call you out nor look at you right now, but I saw him look over and then turn right around. So I think his pet peeve might be sitting next to him this morning, but we are glad that you are here. If we have not had the opportunity to meet yet, my name is Kevin. I get to serve as one of the pastors here on the team. And it is a great day to be here at Vail. We're starting a brand new series called Relational Vampires. But before we do that, 
Um, for those that are in the room, can you help me welcome those that are joining us online all over Illinois, Arkansas, Missouri, Tokyo, Japan, Iowa, and all over, I guess, the world. It's a great day. Hey, uh, but what I want to do is uh, really quick um, uh, to kind of establish the relational vampires. The truth is, is like all of us have relationships in life. It's pretty much guaranteed. But just because we have relationships doesn't mean they're always easy. Because sometimes what they do is they cost us something, right? Um, if you're a parent, you signed up for this relationship, but your kids, they cost you money, right? We're not gonna talk too much about that one today, right? But what happens when the relationships cost you time, cost you energy, cost you joy, cost you your strength, cost you uh, emotional intelligence to the point where you, know, you just feel drained. What about that? Well, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this next month and we're gonna talk about those relationships, those costly relationships and how we can keep our joy, how we can sustain our strength and how we can make sure that we can navigate as a human being, but also love the people that we are in relationship the way that God calls us to do. Now, I will tell you this, this is we're talking about people like this, okay? Needy people, um, uh, critical people, and controlling people. So really quick, before we begin, raise your hand if you know anybody that fits those categories. Okay, all right, we have a room full of not liars. Good, everybody's hand pretty much was up, okay? This is just pretty much everybody, okay? Um, but here's what I will tell you. Before we can continue, I wanna set some ground rules, some boundaries, so to say. Um, when I was growing up, I have a lot of siblings, and so we had our house rules to make sure that we could navigate together um, without murdering one another. So I figured I'd introduce those rules to you today. Here's the rules. First rule is this. Do not not lie. Seems pretty self-explanatory, right? Like if you want to have good relationships, if you don't want to murder anybody, then just be honest, be, you know, be aware, okay? So don't lie. The second rule is this, always be aware of your surroundings, okay? Now what I want to do is I want to incorporate these rules today, right? Don't lie. Yeah, you better not lie, Kevin. You're on a platform at a church. Like, no, don't do that. I'm not going to do that. Um, but I do want to incorporate always being aware of my surroundings. And I need to take a moment to get aware of my surroundings. So when I was preparing this message, anybody else like a millennial, like when I think about vampires, I think of like, are you team Jacob? Are you team Edward? <laughs> right? Like what's happening here? And uh, so I, I just like went down the folklore realm like for five minutes before I could really like actually get into this message. And anybody heard the folklore like a vampire can't see themselves in a mirror, right? Right, like that's just an old thing. So I figured, you know what? I'm gonna go into my closet and I'm gonna pull out my mirror. And we're gonna make sure we don't have any vampires in here. So really quick. All right, good. I, you see me, I see you. We don't have any, you know, vampires. <laughs> Everybody waving. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, this mirror is actually a special mirror because what it does is it also shows those are who are 100% likely to be a relational vampire. Ooh, Pastor Kevin flipped the script. Yeah, they bring me in to do that all the time, okay? Because uh, before we can talk about others, we gotta start with ourselves, Here's the thing, the best relationships that we have in life start with us having an awareness of ourself, a self-awareness. Because if we can't control, if we don't know what's happening here, then how on earth can we try to figure out and navigate what's happening around us? And so here's what I wanna tell you is that I am speaking from personal experience. When I first started my ministry career, I had no idea what I was doing. Over a decade ago, they saw this kid and they were like, hey, let's give this kid a chance and let's not give him one title, let's give him two titles. So I was a youth pastor and I was the worship pastor. And what I did was uh, we took a weekend, a Saturday morning, and we got the worship team together and the youth team together because worship was a big part of what we did. And so we were like, hey, we're gonna have a songwriting party. And it was gonna be great. We had like six guitars, six groups. We had a lot of individuals who were creative, who were musicians. It was gonna be awesome. So we got into a place and we said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna split up and everybody's gonna take some time. Even if we just come up with a chorus, if we come up with a verse, whatever it is, let's just come together and let's, let's create something. So everybody did that and it was about 11.30. Everybody came back together and they start, uh, we start sharing. 
And, uh, you know, because I am, uh, you know, super smart and super intelligent, I was the one that was supposed to give all the feedback in that moment. And group after group after group, it was so easy for me to say, hey, actually, um, that chord progression, it was kind of weird, wonky. You went to a weird minor. Um, uh, those lyrics, um, uh, you know, I, I read my Bible, but I have no idea what you just said. That was like church and ease right there. Like, what does that even mean? And I kept giving them feedback after feedback after feedback. And I will tell you that there was one couple that I was really good friends with, and uh, my feedback destroyed them. My criticalness literally brought them to a place where they got up out of their seats and they walked out. And I'm chasing them down. I'm like, what is wrong? What, what's going on? And they're like, are you serious right now? Like, your criticalness is absolutely absurd. And uh, like, I don't know if you know what you're even doing. I should probably tell you that that couple also has a recording contract with Sony, so they know what they're doing. In that moment, I was not aware of what I was actually doing, and it actually took somebody else coming in, and I shared the story with him, and I'm like, man, they walked out. Like, I was embarrassed. I had to leave everybody, and I'm sure that they were embarrassed, and I don't know how to help them. And he looks at me, and we're literally across the table at Starbucks over on college, and he goes, Kevin, I think you missed the whole point. The whole point wasn't for you to create the greatest and latest worship song. The point was for your team to come together and create something amazing that was special for you guys. Even if it wasn't a song, it was relationships. And I think you missed that mark. And I was like, oh, I don't like it, but I think you're right. You see, it took somebody correcting me in that moment and showing me what I couldn't see. In fact, I love what Jesus says in Matthew chapter seven, verses one through five. It says this, do not judge others and you will not be judged, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged, and why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? And he continues, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Now, here's what I will tell you, is that in this moment, what Jesus is doing is he is basically saying, hey, there is correction that is needed. There is always correction. As a Christ follower, you have opened up the door to allow other Christ followers, brothers and sisters in Christ, to say, hey, I think you may have missed the mark. But judgment is a whole nother thing. And judgment is reserved for only God and God alone. In fact, this is uh, shortly after one of Jesus' most famous sermons, and this is a moment where he's speaking, and it's for all of us. It's not just a moment for when he was speaking to the people there, but it still speaks to us today. Hey, before you call out judgment, before you call out correction, um, you need to navigate which, which pocket it actually fits into, because one is okay and one is not. And so what I, want to day, what I want to do today is I want to look through a biblical lens for us to be able to walk through life, walk through relationships, interact with relational vampires, whether it's one in the mirror or one not in a mirror. And I want us to be able to do it in a place where we can walk without having a ginormous log in our eye where we won't be blinded. So what I wanna do before we continue is will you join me in prayer just to ask for God's spirit to anoint us today and to, to carry us. So God, we give you this morning, we ask that you speak to us as we talk about things that are really personal for us. Um, God, I just pray that you lead us and that you carry us in ways that we've never felt before, but God, that you take us to places that we've never been before. And it's in your wonderful and holy name we say, hey. Men. So what I want to do is I want to take a simple three-step process today to help all of us, okay? And the first step is this. The first step is to look up. Everybody say look up. Look up. Now, that is uh, simple, right? Kevin, look up. What does it mean? Well, let's just take it from this posture, right? In order for us to look up, I'm not talking about looking up at blinding lights or HVAC or insulation in a ceiling. I'm talking about looking up to our creator, the one who designed the blueprints, 
the one who scripture says knew us before we were ever known, who knows the number of hairs on our head, who loves us and cares about us, look to the one, look up. If we want to start from a place where we can walk without a log in our eye, we have to look at the one who created perfection, who designed perfection, but still gave us free will. In fact, the one thing that I will tell you is this, that when we step into a relationship with God, when we say yes to a relationship, when we invite Jesus into our heart, when we accept that, that gift that he has given us, instantly, we have unlocked his spirit living in us and through us, where we no longer have to work alone, where we don't have to navigate the world alone. And so in order for us to actually use that, we have to start with the one who gave us the gift in the first place. We have to look up. We have to start there and allow him to fill us. Earlier, I talked about, you know, relational vampires have the potential to rob us of our joy. This summer, we did a series called Fruit of the Spirit, right? The Fruits of Life, Juiced. That was the name of the series. And uh, one of the fruits of the Spirit is literally joy. It is a God-given gift to you, which means that it's not meant to be something that somebody else can take away from you. It's something that comes from God, only comes from God, and it's supposed to fill you from the inside to the point where it begins to spill out over into every other area of your life. There's a moment when Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, and this is what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. He says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, for the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now, I want to pause right here because this veil, the veil that he's talking about is actually the veil that Moses had to wear when he came down from Mount Sinai. When Moses was able to receive the Ten Commandments, the tablets, the, the law that, that God handed down for his people to experience life to the fullest, Moses had a mountaintop experience where there was an actual like glowing in his face to the point where people around him, they couldn't see that because it was God's presence. You couldn't be in God's presence unless you were like God's chosen, you know, a prophet. Like that was just the rules of the day. Thank God we don't have to navigate through that because what Jesus did, when Jesus came into the picture, when he died on the cross, the veil that separated God, God's presence from God's creation was torn and that relationship was restored. But in this moment, what Paul is doing is he's referencing back to the veil that Moses had to wear so that other people couldn't see God's presence. But he says that when we step into that relationship, when someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is absolute freedom so that all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect, everybody say reflect, the glory of the Lord. And the Lord who is the Spirit makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. That's incredible. Because that means that a separation between us and God exists no more. But it also means that now our lives get to be a reflection of who God is, which means that if we want to be a reflection of him, we gotta start with him. If you don't start with him, how could you ever begin to look like him? I wrote down some practical things so that we can have this you know, awareness in ourself. It may mean that every single day when you wake up, you start your day and you're like, God, more of you and less of me. More of you and less of me. God, show me your glory here. Show me your patience because I have none. And every parent said amen. Now the second step, the first step, look up. The second step, look in. Everybody say look in. You're gonna do that at least one more time today. Now, this step requires absolute humility, okay? Because this is where we take a look at ourselves. Now, the one thing that's gonna get in the way of this is pride. Pride and humility are two very different things. In fact, I love what Thomas Merton says. He says this, pride makes us artificial and humility makes us real. Pride will say, there's nothing wrong with me. There's something wrong with everybody else. And so I'm gonna help fix them because I'm good. Hmm. But it's okay if you've been there. We've all been there at some point. It's just something that we have to be aware of. 
We have to humble ourselves to actually look at this, and this is where we have to build a self-awareness. It may, we may need to ask these questions. Where do I need help? What's holding me back? What am I believing is truth that's actually not truth, that's not fact? What am I holding back from others? And if you need help, don't worry, you're not alone. There's actually a moment when King David, he writes this Psalm, Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, and this is what he says. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. I should probably tell you that everything else before this moment in this Psalm is also David acknowledging that God already knows. God already knows you. God already knows your struggles, your temptation. God already knows the frustrations, the things that you are going to ask God for. He already knows before you ever even ask. But what David does is he humbles himself and he says, you know, God, I, I, I just, I need you to point these things out in me. And then he says, I can never escape your spirit. He finishes that, that chapter with that. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but like, that can be a little relational vampire, like vampirial. I don't even know if that's a word, but I just made it up. Like, that's a little bit scary. Like, what do you mean, I can never escape? What do you mean, he, he's never not looking at me? Like, that, that's kind of that's weird. It's actually not meant to be weird. It's actually supposed to be a freeing truth for us that means this, that God already knows you. He knows your struggles. He knows what you need. He can give you what you need. He sees the things that you want, the things that you desire, the things that you hope for, and he wants you to have those things as long as they fall into the plan for you living the best life that you can possibly live. He knows it. He sees it, and he sees you, which means this, that we can find God in literally every situation in our life, in every temptation, in every relationship, in every season where it's just we feel down in the pitfalls of, uh, you know, I just, you know, God, I'm at a place in my life where if I could get, you know, just closed up in my house and only have to deal with Amazon Prime deliveries, I'm good. He sees you in those moments. And here's what I will tell you is that sometimes, practically what we can do is we can, we can say a dangerous prayer, just like David did. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Everlasting life goes beyond your expiration date here on this earth. We're talking about eternity, forevermore. Which leads us to our third and final step. And I need to preemptively apologize, okay? Because it's this. Look out! Did I get anybody? It's October. I gotta spook you a little bit. The third and final step is look out because you have to be careful. The first step is to look up. The second step is to look in. And the third step is to look out. You have to look out all around you because if you're not careful, you're gonna fall into the trap of the enemy, which is this, to try to fix everybody else's issues before you ever deal with your own. That is the pitfalls that will get us into trouble. I love, let's just reiterate what Jesus said in Matthew chapter seven, verse five. He says, hypocrite. You know what hypocrite is translated to? It's pretty much this. Actor, you phony, you fake. First, get rid of the log in your own eye, then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. So I started thinking about this a little bit. And I'm a very visual person. And, you know, I like, I like seeing things, feeling things, making it personal. You see, what Jesus is saying is that too often we can walk around life and we can see the issues in somebody else's life but we're still carrying a log. But the log isn't just in our hands, it's actually in our eyes, which means this, that we don't have a clear sight. We don't have, here, like we don't have a clear sight. You can't see me, I can't see you, and this is weird. Anybody else kind of like, okay, bring the log down now, Kevin. <laughs> Here's the thing though, 
is that if we're not careful, we'll try to fix other people's issues before dealing with our own. But can I tell you this, that one of the biggest pitfalls that I have found is that most of the time, our own log is the thing that's causing specks of dust in somebody else's eye. And we can get ourselves into trouble because we adopt the philosophy of this. Anybody ever heard the phrase, do as I say, not as I do? That's a dangerous place to be in life. It's not wise. You know what else isn't wise? Not being intentional with what you surround yourself with. Not being intentional with the relationships the information that you have around you, the influence that you surround yourself with. And again, I say that you surround yourself with because it is a choice that you have to make. Please do not expect me to follow you around and say, that's wise, that's not wise. I don't have enough time in life. (laughs) Solomon says this in Proverbs 13, verse 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. It doesn't say separate yourself and not be around people. It says be intentional. Be intentional. Be intentional with the influence that is all around you. There's always influence, and if you're not intentional with it, you will get trapped. If you don't believe me, raise your hand if you have a spouse or a significant other, a dating relationship, raise your hand if you have a friend in your life that's like a solid friend, a good friend, and keep your hand up. Raise your hand if you have siblings and you guys have like a secret uh, language that only you know that your parents still haven't figured out 30 years later. Okay, all right, that's all of us. Now, uh, have you ever gone into like a social gathering of some sort and before you walk in, you have to lay out the ground rules, right? You have to clearly like have the expectations. And if you're, you're here and you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, uh, we've all been in a place where we go to the in-laws and we're like, all right, 7.30, honey. 7.30. The game is on later. And I've got it recorded, but I don't want to miss it. Or, hey, if, if you see me trapped by Uncle Vinny, you come running. If I text you the number two, that doesn't mean walk. That means run. We need help. Or my favorite yet, and I am so guilty of this. This is so personal for me. All right, honey, when we go into this place, here's what's going to happen. If somebody comes up and I don't introduce you, here's what I need you to do. I need you to apologize for my rudeness, introduce yourself so that I can hear their name and you can hear their name and that way we both know who they are and it's gonna work out. Yes. I'm stepping on toes and calling y'all out. Here's the thing. Life and faith are no different. We need to be prepared before we can proceed. We have to be intentional before we can move forward. This three-step process is so important because the truth is, is that it's God's plan. It's God's plan, and the truth is, is that it not only affects you and you and you, but it affects everybody around you. It's not just about you, it's about you and others, but it has to start with you and God. There's actually a moment in Mark chapter 12 where Jesus is approached by this religious teacher. And this religious teacher is basically trying to trip Jesus up. And he's like, Jesus, and you have to say it like that because he's, you know, hoity-toity. Jesus, what is thou is greatest commandment? This is uh, an interpretation of scripture. Please do not quote me. I am not taking or adding, okay? But here's the thing. Jesus responds with something so profound and so powerful when asked, what is the greatest commandment? It says this in verses 29 through 31. Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel. Hey, listen up. We gotta be ready. The Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And the second is equally as important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. You see, the three-step process, 
look up, look in, and look out. Jesus laid it out for us. In fact, go back one more one slide. Check this out. Look up. What are we supposed to do? You must love the Lord your God. It starts with that. Why did Jesus start with that? Oh, look up. Look in. Well, how do I do that? How do I love the Lord God? Check it out. With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Okay, look up, look in, and look out. Why is it so important? Because on the very next verse, the second, which is equally as important, love your neighbor as yourself. Hmm. How do I define how to love my neighbor? Well, it has to start here. So if you want to learn how to love a relational vampire, you need to learn to, to learn you need to learn to love the one in the mirror. You need to learn how to bring awareness to the one in the mirror. It starts with a relationship with God, which helps define who you are and the values you have to the very core of your inner being. And then you can start to see others in a whole new light, which may just be the definition of how God sees them, how God loves them. In fact, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. I know I'm throwing a lot of scripture at you. You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it has lost its favor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Again, there's that, that reiteration that it's not just about you. There's other impacts. There's other implications of the process of look up, look in, and look out. Did you know this, that salt back in this time was actually something that was so valuable because what it did is it brought life. It was something that you had to have in order to preserve food so that mothers could feed their children. It brought flavor. It was important. Light was also important because light was something that in that time, there would be a, a city. Every time a city was demolished or every time a city was overthrown, a new city would just be built right on top of it. And so it got taller and taller and taller and taller and taller to the point where it was a journey, it was a process for people to be able to find the place that had people that could help, whether it was um, the sick looking for, for healing, whether it was somebody looking for hope or joy, somebody was looking for help and assistance and alliance. The light that was on the hill was actually a place where people could see it, even from a distance, so that they could know where to walk. They could know where to go, where they could find healing, where they could find peace, where they could find a source of joy. Look up, look in, and look out. But why? You see, this three-step process is actually an equation with a very specific, specific order of operation for not only for us to live the best life that we can possibly live, but for others to possibly live and walk in the best life that they can possibly live. Anybody you remember, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Some of you just had like trauma brought back to life from math class. The one thing that I learned in my math class was that the order of operation matters. And here's what I will tell you. This order of operation really matters. Because how on earth could we try to evaluate what's happening right here if we don't look at the blueprints? If we don't accept God's joy, God's love, God's peace, God's freedom, we can't. The order absolutely matters. And you see what this is, is it's a place where we start this week and I'm, I am begging you, please come back. Please, please, please make it a point, even if you can't be here in person, join us online at some point. Because what this is, is it is a strategy to start from a place of wisdom, truth, and grace, which starts between you and God, and then 
we will proceed with caution. We will walk through life with caution. And I will tell you this, that this process is never too late. You may feel like you need to get things in order before you can get to a place where you can look up, look in, let alone look out. I spoke with a gentleman last night and uh, he was sharing how hard this process has been. Because he's like, I, I don't know where to start. I don't know where to begin because uh, I've been battling this addiction for over 30 years. In fact, Kevin, I'm not gonna tell you, it's probably closer to 50. And I just know that it's not what God wants for me. Here's what I will tell you. It is never too late. It is a journey. It is a lifelong process. It just means that you have to start it. It just means that you have to take one step. And can I tell you this? Can I be honest? You may feel like you need to get your house in order before you can invite God into your house, but the truth is, is that he already sees it. He already sees the mess, but yet he still loves us. He still pursues us. He still wants us to have that freedom. And I can't remember when in life I realized that the rules of do not lie and to always be aware of my surroundings, it's actually the blueprint for us to live the best life that we can possibly live, to have the greatest relationships in life, starting with God, because that's where God starts. God has never lied. He will never lie. He loves you. He cares about you, regardless of where you've been, where you're at, or where you think you are going. He wants to surround you in every area of your life with his freedom, because he knows how much we need it. That's why he sent Jesus there's no other reason why a father would send their one and only son to die as a way to pay a debt for somebody else unless he absolutely loves us. It's never too late. It is never too late. Look up, look in, and look out, but it has to start with God. I will tell you this, that the Bible says that in order for us to start that relationship, it's super simple. It's so simple, it, it will like melt your brain if you think about it for too long. Because all we have to do is believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that God is who he says he is, that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us, not to stay dead, not to just be buried and for us to talk about it, but so that we could, we could see him be brought back to life three days later. And for us to walk in a newness of life a new hope, a new covenant, a new agreement of us walking in relationship with our heavenly father who designed perfection for each and every single one of us. So with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, you may be here and you may be in this spot where today is the day that you're hitting the start button. You can do that right now, right here in this place. It's simple. Invite God. Say, God, I wanna start with you. This is the moment where it begins, right here, right now. And you may be here, and you may be in a spot where it's way easier for you to see the issues all around you rather than to deal with the ones inside of you. It's not too late to start. Right here, right now, today. God, we thank you so much, Lord, for this opportunity to be in this place. God, to come into an atmosphere where your presence is the thing that trumps every other feeling in life. Because I know, God, that it's not easy for us to start from a place of humility, to give everything to you, and to ask you to show us the things in life that we need to navigate in our own lives before we can ever navigate with anyone else. So, Lord, give us hope, give us compassion even for ourselves. God, give us empathy. But God, let us pursue you in a way that brings us life, that restores your definition of joy in our life, that gives us the strength to keep, keep on going and to love others the way that you love us. And it's in your wonderful and holy name we say, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, here's what I wanna do. I wanna take this next just minute 
because I wanna ask you, if you started a relationship today, every single weekend we have individuals that are stepping into a relationship with God, moving closer to him, and I will tell you that that is a scary place to be, but it is a freeing place to be, and you do not have to walk on that journey alone because what I'm gonna ask you to do is I'm gonna count to three, and if you made a decision today, whether online, go ahead, drop a comment in the chat, or here in the room, I'm gonna ask you to have a moment of boldness where you raise your hand because we don't wanna embarrass you, but we wanna give you resources to help you navigate as you begin this journey, as you begin this process. And it may not be a five-minute process. It may be something where you are figuring things out, asking questions. That is okay. But we want to give you a healthy place to start and help walk with you as you start this journey. So I want you to know that, one, God loves you that he cares about you so much that he sent to his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for you so that you could live life to the fullest. Three, if you made a decision today, I just want you to raise your hand and say, that is me, I started this relationship. Today is the day that I start that. Well, I will tell you this, every weekend, somebody is making a decision, and I know that last month, we had an incredible amount that started that, so we can celebrate that decision today. God, we thank you. Well, let's kind of close today's experience. Maybe you have a next step of faith today. Maybe that's jumping into a serving team. We talk about this idea of being relational vampires, about the people in our life that maybe suck the energy out of us. So maybe we can be like that sometimes. Maybe we can feel a little bit critical. One of the best ways to fight that is get alongside some other people and serve together and get outside yourself and be a part of something bigger than yourself. So maybe that is, is for you. Jump on a serving team. You can grab the My Next Step card in the seat back pocket in front of you. You can text NEXT to 309-777-0677. And maybe that next step for you may be giving. Like maybe putting that full trust and faith in who Jesus is in your life. I know for me, I started with a little bit. When I was younger, hey, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give a little bit of tip. I'm gonna give when I got a little bit of excess. Then slowly but surely, uh, God just transformed my heart. Where I was able to give consistently, not out of a bragging heart of me, but it was just out of a faith and knowing that God continually has shown up in my life. And maybe that's for you. Maybe if you haven't yet started giving, it's a, hey, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna put this in for, with faith today. I'm gonna trust that God is who he says he is. And maybe for someone else, it's like, I've, I'm doing that, but I've I followed Jesus long enough, I need to put that full faith, and I need to start giving, rec like recurring. There are four ways to do that today. There are giving boxes on each exit, two in the lobby. You can text Vail to 77977. You can go online at our website, or you can go to our Vail Church app to set up a one-time or recurring gift. And I want you guys to know that uh, Jared is out in the lobby today. So if you have any questions about CFR, make sure you stop off in the lobby. Jared came all the way from Wisconsin here just to connect with you guys and share what they're, what they're doing. There's no pressure. If you have any more questions, you can look at the pamphlet. It'll answer as much as you can. You can scan that QR code um, where they can follow up with you a little bit later today. And as we close today's experience, we have community elements on both sides of our stages. Our prayer team is right up front. They would love to pray for today. We're going to keep the volume down a little bit lower. So if you want to sit in here and reflect on today's message, feel free to do that. But for everyone else, you are dismissed. God bless you. Have an incredible day.